Evidence-based practice is used in nursing. We, we talked about this in learning plan one, but I want to reinforce it that evidence-based practice is used to provide the best possible care at hopefully reduced costs. That reduced cost is not the driver in evidence-based practice, but that is a hope for outcome. If a person can be kept healthy using evidence-based or discharged quicker, the outcome is good for the patient, good for the facility, good for the economy as a whole. So we always want to consciously incorporate evidence-based practice whenever possible. Um, now, there are steps in using evidence-based practice. And first and foremost is performing a search for the most relevant evidence. And then you need to make sure the evidence is actually logical and valid to your situation. We talked about this again for learning plan one. Does the evidence fit in with what, what would work here? Um, let's say that evidence you have found evidence that acupuncture is ideal for um, high blood pressure. I'm making that up. That might be very that might be totally valid. But if you have no acupuncturist, it doesn't matter. You can't use it. So you have to make sure that the evidence you find is applicable to your situation. And will the patient actually go along with it? Again, acupuncture may be best for, for, the, for the disease process, but if the patient doesn't want needles stuck in them, it doesn't matter. Patient preference is very important. If the patients do not want something, you probably won't be doing it. Patients have the right to choose, right? They always have the right to choose. So if we, if we find excellent evidence-based evidence practice that says uh, the application of fresh cow manure uh, to the body will, will rid them of um, drug-induced rashes, well, great. Good luck in getting patients to do it, though. It's just not going to happen. So we have to always look at, at patient-client uh, preference. We're not really focusing on cost. That is the last priority. In fact, a lot of times evidence-based practices are more expensive. They're new, they sometimes use cutting-edge technology, uh, so that is not a, not, a, not a major decider, the cost. Patient preference is a major decider. We talked briefly about shortage of nurses and why. Um, nurses are retiring. Uh, average age of nurses are, oh, I, 52, 54, I think, something like that. And while that's not old, because I know somebody who's 52, thank you very much, those are people who are getting close to retirement age. Uh, a survey showed that, um, this was done in, in the early 2000s, that 55% um, of nurses intend on retiring between 2011 and 2020. That isn't far off. So there will be a huge shortage very shortly. And of course, at the same time nurses are retiring, the baby boomers are, are getting older, and older people tend to f use the healthcare system even more. So there's going to be sicker people, peep, sicker people, sicker people, fewer nurses. So what can we do to recruit nurses to the profession? You know, we can advertise. Uh, recruitment, recruitment, woo, recruitment material in high schools and hospitals and nursing schools. Uh, I, yeah, we can. But how many of you knew you wanted to be a nurse in high school? My guess is probably about half the people in this group raised their hand. How many of you didn't figure it out until you were in your 20s or early 30s? That was me. So we need to find another way of, of reaching those people. Many nurses don't enter the field especially men, until it's their second or third career. We also need to improve the work environment for nurses. We're nurses work hard. If you're a CNA, you know how hard you work. And believe me, actually nurses work as hard, just differently. If you're an LPN, you know how hard you work. We work on our feet. We work bent over. By the way, don't work bent over. We have beds that raise, right? With the push of a button. When I was a new CNA, I had to crank the bed up using a, a crank at the bottom of the bed. And you had to do that bent over, right? 
kind of defeat the purpose. We have a button. It raises the bed. Work standing up. It's so much better for your back. Most nurses leave the field because of back injuries. What else can we do to, to keep nurses? We can pay better. That's easy. That's actually very easy. They don't do it because it's expensive, but it's an easy way of making nurses happier. Increase your pay. But there's other ways that aren't as expensive. Flexible staffing. Letting people choose the shifts they want to work that work in their, with their family. That's a big plus. If you have children at home, you see them off in the morning on the bus, you, you want to be home when they're done, wouldn't it be nice if you could find an organization that worked you from, you know, 9 till 2? Or just in the evenings? You know, the organizations need to get creative in, in finding ways to keep the people working when they want to work. Allow some autonomy. What does that mean? That means create protocols that allow the nurses to take action on their own based on their assessments. Now, when I worked in the critical care, we had, we had protocols that if a potassium level came back at a certain level, we were allowed to automatically initiate a potassium rider. We didn't, we didn't need a, a specific doctor's order because we had a protocol that was in place. It gave us a little bit of authority. Need to improve communication and interpersonal, interpersonal relationships on the job between employees and between employees and management. Work recognition. You've done a good job. Wouldn't it be nice if somebody to, not only told you that, but recognized you for it? Uh, when I was at Aurora, they had Employee of the Month uh, awards. They had Aurora Stars, um, which you could earn if, if somebody wrote a letter complimenting you. It's kind of nice to, to get a recognition that, hey, I did something good. Nice. Pro provide professional practice. Provide the, the means to improve practice. It would be great. It would be awesome if every nurse was allowed, say, four hours a pay period to focus on professional development to do a little bit of research, to practice a new skill, to go to a different unit and learn in a different unit. Oh, wouldn't, wouldn't that be great if you were allowed and give, not only allowed, but paid to improve your skills, to become a better nurse? If you worked in a facility that did that, would you stay? Probably. How about a, um, a facility that allowed self-scheduling? The manager didn't put out the schedule every two weeks or however often. Instead, everybody filled out the schedule on their own. When I worked critical care, that's what we did. We had a relatively small unit. And we probably had maybe 15, 20 nurses tops. And we knew how many nurses had to work every shift. So once a month, the, the, the schedule would get posted, and it was first come, first serve. And like I worked uh, five five nights a week, night shift, and I would just go in and I would pick my nights. Well, it's pretty easy, five nights a week, and you had to work you know, every other weekend, so I didn't have a whole lot of options. But when I was working uh, as a nurse PM, uh, on PM shift, I was only working half time. So I had to pick my five shifts every two weeks. It gave me some flexibility, it gave me some control. I knew when I could work. I knew that if something was coming up, I could work around it rather than having to ask off. So if a facility allowed that, now it's a little more chaotic. It is. And it takes management, it takes the strength of management to be able to stand back and let it happen, and yet still make sure that everything gets done right. So it's not easy for managers, other than they don't have to worry about people saying, oh, I need, I need off tomorrow. I forgot I have a dentist appointment. No, you, you need to work your schedule around your life because you know what your life is. So that's, that's kind of nice. The last way we can do it to improve nursing is we can have magnet hospitals. And a magnet hospital is, is um, an award from the American Nurses Association. It's a nursing-based award. And it only awards hospitals that are, uh, have excellence in nursing. And there's 14 magnets, uh, forces of magnetism. Um, I'm not going to go into all those. Um, but a magnet hospital, if a, a hospital says we are a magnet hospital, what it's saying is we have some of the best nurses and nursing systems that there are.
A few things at magnet hospitals, one major thing is half of the nurses must have BSNs or better. Now that's partly why there's a bigger push on BSN nurses. There's no man mandatory law on BSNs in Wisconsin. But hospitals want that status. They want magnet status, which means they want to hire BSNs, especially Milwaukee and Madison. If you want a job down there, really, the reality is you need to be working toward your BSN if you want to truly be a candidate, because that will make you rise to the top. If you go in with an associate's degree, yes, you're an RN, and you can work as an RN, and they can hire you. But if you're working toward a bachelor's or have a bachelor's, you've just eliminated one hurdle and you've made them, you've made yourself more desirable for them because it's going to help their stats, their statistics on how many BSNs they have working there. So something to think about. Come back for, the, for part four. We're going to talk about types of healthcare organizations.